So the plan is to um, expand the system to our other three ferries across the system. So they're all using um, tablet-based uh, real-time <coughs> ferry tracking system that we've developed in-house. Slide 14 um, talks about uh, kind of a central data hub and website improvements. So we do collect quite a bit of data information and data that we use internally at the department, in the department, uh, but this data is also useful for a variety of pur purposes and along with the GNWT um, initiative to kind of move towards um, more open government, we want a plan to be able to put this data in its rawest form available on the website so that um, more people can have access to it um, and do some great work with it. Uh, the other thing uh, that we're going to work to do, to do is it actually improve our website so it's easier to use um, from the public's perspective and then of course tie in all of this new technology and information that we're getting across the system onto uh, the central website. So data sets such as our traffic volumes, our full collision database, um, motor vehicle system information, all of this data we want available um, to researchers and the public generally. Slide 15 uh, talks about thermistor arrays and, and this really gets into some of the really valuable data uh, that we are collecting and that we plan to co collect more of. Uh, this of course helps um, infrastructure engineering and decisions and planning, but it also uh, is important for all of the researchers currently working on climate change and permafrost research. So they collect temperature data below the road surface, and it's important from an infrastructure perspective because it monitors the behavior of permafrost and the impacts of climate change <coughs> on our highway system. We are proposing 10 new deployments. Um, including seven at uh, the new ARWA sites that are proposed and three in additional locations. Slide 16. As you're aware, we've made uh, some substantive improvements to our commercial trucking permit system. And so the commercial trucking sector is, um, can apply and obtain permits online now, which is much simpler for them and it eases the, I guess, the time and the administrative burden of them having to physically stop at the Enterprise Wayscale and bought, purchase those permits there. Now, oh, there's a huge benefit to that, but the challenge is, is that we used to collect a really good transportation of goods data at that scale, and so we're gonna work to uh, incorporate increased collection of transportation of goods data into uh, the permitting system. So we still have a full data set. As you're aware, there's been um, you know, some very significant accidents across the national highway system, like the lac Megantic accident, etc. So jurisdictions across the country are making sure that uh, we have better and real-time information about what dangerous goods are traveling on our highway system and at any given moment. Uh, to make sure that we know well, what the good is and the quantity of that in, uh, in <coughs> real time. And so um, information collected as part of this will be origin destination data, so we'll understand where those commodities are coming from, the commodity type, the dangerous good type, um, and all of that. <coughs> We've also been working um, with other jurisdictions uh, to feed into the Canadian Centre for Transportation Data. And so it's a kind of a central national uh, hub that is also housing kind of transportation data for, on a national scale. So this will also uh, feed into that initiative on a national level. So slide 17. As you're aware, uh, when we constructed the Inuvik Tech Highway. Uh, we really uh, focused as much as we could on research and development and collecting climate change information. 
um, on that segment of highway, it was of international interest because it was the first highway in many years that's been built in that type of terrain uh, in that geographical kind of location. And so it's been an interest to researchers across Canada, but then also across the circumpolar north and beyond. So we have quite a few uh, instrument instrumentation sites along that highway. We also have quite a few on Highway 8 right now. So we're monitoring permafrost, climate, and performance of the road structure. The challenge right now is that data needs to be manually collected from our data logger. So now the technology is, is such that we can remotely upload that. And of course, link to uh, the open access uh, database, then researchers from, from anywhere where in the world can access that data. And we're hoping that it will maximize the amount of good research that we're getting um, as part of that investment. So slide 18 just kind of talks about uh, uh, the strategies that we currently have in place that this is, I guess, helping to continue to implement. So one, our NWT transportation strategy, which is a 20-year plan. Of course, one of the goals of that is to enhance, to enhance existing information technology systems and add new data collection platforms to improve service delivery. And of course, we have a NWT road safety plan. Uh, these documents are both available on our website. And the goal of that is to reduce collisions and fatalities on NWT roads. So the ITS component um, is just one component of the, of the many things that we're doing to improve road safety. Uh, things like engineering and infrastructure improvements on the highway sy system itself. Um, things like increased education of the public on road safety. Of course, we have our ongoing communication on road safety uh, that happens. Uh, you've been involved in uh, also legislative changes uh, related to impaired driving and all of those, I guess all of these efforts together, um, focusing on enforcement, um, enforcement and legislation, education and engineering um, all kind of come together to uh, improve road sa safety across the system, and this is just one component of that. So on slide 19, which is the final slide, it just talks about next steps. So uh, we've been working uh, to kind of uh, take a look at the entire system and put together this five-year plan based on our current needs and the amount of resources that we have and where the, the priorities are currently. Uh, we are working in the background to develop our request for proposals that will be issued um, fairly shortly, either late December or early January, um, and then we'll proceed through procurement and start the implementation plan over the next five years. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, excellent. Thank you, Ms. Robertson. Comments, questions, concerns from committee? Who wants to start? We'll start with Mr. Start. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So you, the, in the presentation, you mentioned uh, some of the details on how increased data collection is going to help uh, improve road safety and reduce collisions. Can we hear some practical <laughs> examples of how this technology is going to help kind of the day-to-day -day lives of Northerners as it relates to road safety? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Robertson. Thank you, Will. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Uh, so one practical example is that uh, is the web-based cameras. And so um, from an individual level, before someone's uh, planning to take a road trip, for example, they can access our website. They can physically uh, see exactly what the road uh, conditions are at that moment. So they can tell whether it's snow-covered or dry and bare. Um, and make uh, decisions about whether or not they might want to head out uh, at that point. Uh, they can also um, do make some assumptions about how long it's going to take them to get there. Of course, when we all have to drive according to the road conditions, and so when the conditions are, in a, are not optimal, uh, then we shouldn't be driving at the maximum speed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Tester. 
So is the department planning to kind of produce advisories when road conditions are um, dangerous, for example, when there's a lot of snow cover, and pass that along as well? Or is it just, are we letting kind of citizens make up their own minds based on what they see on webcams, or are we actually being proactive about uh, alerting people to those conditions through Twitter, through the Facebook page, through um, email subscription, whatever have, have you? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Robertson? Thank you. Uh, so um, we currently do um, communicate all the conditions across the highway system on our website. So we have we currently have a highway condition map where you're, it's an interactive map. So you can actually um, even click on the individual segments and it'll show you specifically uh, what to watch out for, whether there's construction at a certain uh, location, whether um, speed is reduced or weight restrictions are reduced. It talks about the current conditions. That information is also um, not only available on our website, but it's, we also have um, a Twitter account that we use uh, quite often. We have, um, well, any time conditions change and the public should be aware of that changing condition. So if we have, you know, um, ice, ice C-sections or open or closures so we communicate through, uh, through Twitter as well. We also have at the regional level um, our highway condition reports which are emailed out uh, to the commercial transportation sector and other stakeholders so we try to get the message out that way. Thank you Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further Mr. Testart. Thank you Mr. Chair. Thank you for those examples. Um, in the minister's opening comments, um, he spoke to these improvements, the ITS improvements um, will improve energy efficiency, reduce greenhouse gases, um, I'm, I'm in strengthen public-private partnerships. I'm interested in the, the, the clean energy side of this. Um, how specifically will these improvements that are contained in the presentation um, reduce or improve energy efficiency and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, providing accurate, I guess, condition information um, to, to two, I guess, groups of people, one to, the tra one to travelers themselves and the other to our operation and maintenance crews uh, will, I guess, reduce the number of wasted trips and I guess improve the efficiency of operations and just to provide an example um, so quite often um, you know travelers will start heading out they'll realize that the conditions are are terrible they might uh, choose choose to drive at a different time um, so it may may result in reduced trips that way but I think that Efficiencies and the energy savings uh, will primarily come from uh, our own operations and maintenance. So, of course, we have uh, plow trucks and sand trucks and graders and um, and heavy equipment all across our transportation system at all times. And so, we can make sure that we're targeting those crews to the areas that need it most when it's needed. Right now. Uh, operation and maintenance crews are having to physically travel out that 200 kilometers to see how conditions are on the ground. They'll be able to see how the conditions are on the ground right before they head out so it will result in um, <coughs> I guess more efficient operations and maintenance and planning and less wasted uh, trips with heavy equipment on the highway system. Thank you Mr. Chair. Okay thank you. Anything further Mr. Testart? Yes. So, the what what is the predicted total amount of uh, save of greenhouse gas reductions and energy savings uh, due to decreased pr the predicted decrease in operational um, uh, in operations? Thank you, Ms. Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We haven't calculated the total for the ITS system. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further? Mr. Testart? Thank, thank you. So when you put that in a presentation, let's have more than just assumptions, right? Because the uh, 
these are important mandate commitments, and I know that trying to fit everything into those mandate commitments is, is how we do business off quite often, but uh, I'm interested in these reductions, especially with uh, the audit work we've done on, on the climate change strategy and climate change overall leadership. So if this is going to make a dent, let's find out how much that's going to do. And uh, if, you, if you don't have the data to work on that, that's fine. But, you know, this is a, a very strong statement about what this is going to do. And if it's not clear how it's really going to work out, um, it, it, it's, it's difficult for me to take that information on face value. I'd like to see more um, c concrete examples, more concrete evidence and, and calculations done when there is a government public policy initiative that is targeted at reducing uh, greenhouse gas initiatives. Don't get me wrong, I think a lot of these uh, technologies are important and are going to help. Um, but they might not do these things if we, if we can't cal quantify, calculate, and understand them clearly towards those objectives. I think they do other very important things, and I'm not saying this is bad, but if we're going to make it do something else, let's make sure we can back that up with evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Take that as a comment. To the comment. Comment noted. Next I have Mr. Simpson. Thank you. During the presentation, it was mentioned that the new commercial vehicle permitting system has simplified the permitting process. And uh, maybe it has. I haven't seen any any proof one way or the other. And maybe it has for big shipping companies. But I, I've heard uh, from smaller companies that it's actually complicated the process of obtaining permits, and it's increased the administrative burden. And so what some small companies in the territory now do is they contract a third party to obtain these permits on their behalf because that's actually cheaper than having someone spend half a day in the office to to. to fill out all the forms to do everything that needs to be done. And I brought this up on multiple occasions, and I haven't heard of any steps taken to rectify the problem. And in fact, we just heard that now more information is going to be required to get a permit. Um, on, I think it's information on what, uh, what's being transported. So what's the department doing to monitor the effects of these types of changes you know, on the, on the end users? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, we are in you know, ongoing communication with the trucking industry uh, themselves. We've also, um, there was lots of consultation in advance of putting the online commercial vehicle permitting system up. I do understand that the, there are a few companies that um, were experiencing uh, challenges with it. Uh, for that reason, uh, we ensured that uh, there was a, an operator, a third par party operators could apply for permits on their behalf for those companies that uh, chose to uh, go that route. Now the other benefit of online commercial permitting is it allowed us to have our highway transport officers out on the highway system for a lot more time. They were no longer uh, required just to stay in the way scale and they could truly uh, focus on enforcement activities on the highway system, um, making sure that they're doing commercial vehicle inspections and making sure that everybody is operating in compliance. And so, um, you know, with any time there's change and we're moving from a paper base to an electronic system, um, you know, there are some um, challenges or, you know, some folks have challenges with uh, moving to that system, but we are... Uh, working to make sure that third-party providers can do that on their behalf for those that choose. And of course, we're always trying to make uh, improvements to the system to make it uh, simpler uh, for carriers to uh, work within. Um, and then also, um, w I mean, the main goal is to improve uh, highway safety and compliance, and so getting those com those highway transport officers out on the road and making sure that people are operating safely has been an advantage <coughs> of that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Simpson. Thank you. And I, I understand that it's good for the government. The government can get more people out on the road without additional cost to the government, but then it's, it's uh, companies paying third parties to do the work for them, right? So essentially it's offloading uh, the, that cost in, uh, onto industry. Um, I'll move on to a different topic. On slide 11, there's a list showing where the highway traffic cameras will be placed. 
And I noticed that on Highway 1, there's uh, one camera in the first 450 kilometers of the highway, and then there's three cameras over the next 100 kilometers of the highway. And so I was wondering, how are the locations in general chosen? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Robertson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Generally, uh, there was a number of factors that went into choosing the locations for each of the, of the sites on there. Um, uh, some considerations were uh, current uh, ITS technologies that existed. Uh, others were access to uh, power and or telecommunications. Um, uh, we surveyed all of our operation and maintenance operators. Uh, so one consideration was um, what would work best for them to make sure that they could respond in a timely manner uh, for those segments of highways and generally balanced it out. So uh, some, some things like an Arwis station will have multiple um, uses. For example, an Arwis station uh, will also have a camera. So even though there may not be a camera listed uh, nearby, there is an Arwis station which serves the same purpose. So uh, that, that's also to be noted as you're reviewing the locations on the map. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Simpson? Uh, yeah, thank you for that. And so I see that if, if I add the Arwa stations in there, there is actually quite a few more, especially on, on Highway 1. And I bring that highway up in particular because it's the gateway to the territory. And uh, if you're talking about tourism, tourists want to know what the road is like, and it's good to have some information about what that, that long stretch coming into the territory is. So I appreciate that answer. Nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Comment noted. Next I have Mr. Nakamayak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the two previous speakers asked um, some of the questions. Uh, one is getting back to the web cameras, um, getting back to, to points uh, where, where, you, where, you, where you have them close to weather stations and you rely on that information. You've relied on that information for years. I'm just wondering if, um, you know, since 911 is going to be coming down the pipe pretty soon, I'm wondering if any of these cameras may be put in places where there may be emergency runways along the, along the highway to help to help gauge um, whether a helicopter or an airplane may come in case of a spill or, or, a, or, a, or a tour bus crash or something uh, to that nature. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Robertson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think um, the entire ITS system is will be very valuable uh, in terms of emergencies, uh, both the camera system so we can see what's going on, on the ground, for instance, a forest fire, we can actually see the proximity of the fire, let's say, um, <coughs> to the highway system. Um, other things like the, the variable message signs can be uh, deployed quickly uh, to alert travelers. In terms of um, your question specifically about aircraft landing, we have had uh, in cases, in emergency cases only, um, the requirement for planes to land, let's say they're having distress in the air and uh, they cannot make it to the uh, next available airport. Uh, we have had cases where there's been some kind of crash landings on highways, so I guess the answer is yes, uh, those cameras and the entire system will help to uh, provide information uh, back to the people in distress or even the emergency responders. In terms of 911, um, which will be great, I'm hoping also that uh, um, telecommunication providers will continue uh, to expand the communication and cellular network. And so when 911 is fully implement implemented, we're hoping that by that time the cellular network uh, will also catch up so that uh, you'll have 911 service across the highway system as well. And we've been having discussions with um, uh, communication providers and even um, t uh, discussions um, the minister has had with uh, other his federal colleagues um, talking about uh, the importance of communication across the, the north uh, in terms of uh, transportation and of, of course for <coughs> everybody's benefit, even if folks are on the land for emergency response. Uh, the greater the network, the better. So th thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further to that, Minister Schumann. Just to touch on what the, what the Assistant Deputy's talking about at the Innovation Science Table, uh, the last meeting we had too, it's uh, 
it's been brought up at our table there around uh, 911 across the highway system across Canada and the feds are looking at we have a table a working group looking at that and how that can be implemented right across the country so there's some work going on at the federal level <coughs> thank you mr. chair thank you further mr. Nakamayak yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the response. I'm um, getting back to uh, what Mr. Simpson was talking about, about um, about the cost. Um, the government, I wouldn't say that, I'm not going to say just the territorial government, the, but the federal government does this as well, too. Um, they, they break down their, their system to, 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 so that it works conveniently for the government. Then the costs get passed on to consumers, which most of everybody in here has a driver's license, and if something happens down the road, uh, we're going to take on all of those costs. I uh, look at the hotel taxes and other things like that, um, and using third-party systems to, uh, to to help alleviate the stress of, of um, someone who may not be so tech-savvy to, to go online and apply for um, a permit, that would, depending on the type of dangerous goods they may have. I'm just wondering if, um, uh, you know, looking at maybe an app for an iPhone or, or, or something like that that might ease it a little bit so that so that uh, it, it could be tracked more easily, um, not so much just for the general public, but for, but for compliance officers who are, who are patrolling the highway as well, too. I'm wondering how we can simplify something so that uh, the costs don't get passed on to the consumers. Um, uh, when you add it up, you know, a dollar over, over, over years um, adds up, and, and that, that adds up for every customer that's paying out of their own pocket. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To that, Ms. Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when we um, had discussions, I guess, with the commercial trucking um, industry at the time that we implemented the commercial online services, um, some of the big complaints that we were getting was the amount of time it took to actually stop at the way scales and and physically go in and purchase the tickets. Um, and of course, many of the um, commercial transport vehicles are coming from southern uh, jurisdictions delivering goods and so we are constantly I guess getting <coughs> I guess concerns from them about the the amount of time it took and the unpredictability about whether or not the scale was open or closed and really getting pushed by the uh, transportation uh, trucking sector, sector to make improvements to go to an online service. And I do recognize that uh, technology is challenging, especially because um, at this point we don't have uh, consistent cellular coverage across the system and there are some real challenges related to that. Well, we are working, I guess, to uh, address some of those challenges, both in terms of making the system as simple as it possibly can be and responsive to the comments that we're getting back. Um, but I do recognize um, that we want to support all of our small businesses and we do have some northern uh, carriers here that we want to continue supporting so we are cognizant of the costs. In terms of commercial vehicle permits, um, the rates are relatively low compared to other jurisdictions so I guess it's a, we've been trying to balance the costs and the benefits of, of all of those systems and making sure of course that uh, we're working towards uh, safety and, and efficiency of the transportation sector. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Nakamayak? Yeah, just one thing. I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but you know, having having a tracking system where you're working with them. You know, we work with the federal government and other provinces, territories and provinces. You know, w with infrastructure, with all of our roads across Canada, and uh, working together on that part. There's some places where we're going to have to put a lot of a lot of a lot of resources, and some where we don't really need to. But uh, tracking things like this so that we're ready for a spill response or, or, or whatever it may be is likely very, um, very key. And also uh, um, ensuring that residents um, are, are aware of what goes on in the territory on our highway systems and how we can better, uh, I guess, better promote our territory without, uh, without being too complicated in some areas. I see some of the um, deployment locations and traffic counters, that's great. Um, you know, and uh, and I encourage that. You know, we always encourage um, um, tourism in, in all of our region. How do we make it safe for everybody? Um, just more of a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the comment. To the comment, Mr. Schumann. I, I guess the only thing I'd like to add to that is uh, when we're at our federal, provincial, territorial meetings, our FPTs, uh, 
this is a, you know this is something that we're doing across <coughs> our territory, but, but this also leads to what we're trying to do nationally at that table is have an integrated system where it's where you can have access to information, particularly online, for people traveling to be able to access this information to make the decisions that they need to, if they're going to travel or not, or weigh their decisions on even about you know uh, road conditions if they're going to deploy their transport truck to ship goods to stay or not or hold back or whatever. But it's part of a system that we're doing across the country altogether. And uh, I think the department's done some great work here on how we're going to lay this out. And I think it's going to be the benefit of the traveling public and good use for data and tourism as we move forward. So I think this is a good news story for us as a government. And uh, I commend the work that the department's done on this. So and I, and I'm, I see there's some real interest at this table here today on what we're doing. So I'm glad to see that. Thank you, Minister. Next, I have Mr. McNeely. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one of my questions was uh, on, on the issue of 911, and I'm glad to hear the responses and, and the information shared on the progress in preparation for 911, including uh, resource access on the federal level. But on, on the issue of I ITS in, in conjunction with um, journey management, I, I think it's good. It, it gives me the feeling that they're updating the highway safety systems. And my, my, my question is, is how, how is this program or this directive or this project benefiting by the uh, fiber optic linkage? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To that. Ms. Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I guess as uh, the availability of um, data um, and data connectivity across the system increases, it, j it only increases the opportunities that we have to collect and transmit data from that site. So I don't have the specifics about how or if uh, these systems will specifically tie in uh, to the fiber optic line uh, that the GNWT just connected. Um, but I would think that uh, all of the, the connectivity uh, through that corridor would definitely enhance the opportunities for us to send and retrieve data um, and the speed at which, um, in which data can be transmitted. Of course, as we're moving to uh, post more and more of our data online, it also means that residents <coughs> that are accessing and connected to that fiber optic line will have better <coughs> download speeds and have greater access to the data that we're posting online because they have better connectivity. So I guess there's both sides to that um, and both positive. Thanks, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Further, Mr. McNeely. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, that, that leads me to my other question. I, I'm glad that your, your, the journey management upgrade or this program has taken into account what we've invested already in, in, in the fiber optic cable. And it, it leads me to, uh, has there been any thought on a communication repeater tower between the community of Toledo and Fort Wrigley? The reason I ask, there, there's, there's a whole isolation gap in that system and if, if you're if you're traveling from Toledo to Fort Simpson and you pass through Fort Wrigley it's about the middle but it'll take you four to five hours depending on road conditions from Wrigley to Toledo and about the same distance from Wrigley to Fort Simpson but you can do that in two and a half hours so it's five for the winter road travel average and, and half for this highway section. So it takes you longer to cover the same distance. So if we can improve on that system, and I, I just ask, is there any plans for a repeater station or a couple of stations so that people could have within a proximity of, say, 10 miles, have cell phone coverage? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Robertson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, our department uh, doesn't, I guess it's not within our mandate uh, for cellular communication. We do have uh, many discussions with um, 
private sector partners that are involved in that industry. We've been uh, trying to uh, push them for quite some time to expand the cellular, cellular network uh, across the highway system, both on the, the all-weather highway system as well as the winter road system. Um, there are real challenges without not without having cell service, uh, both in terms of safety, but then even for um, operational uh, needs. So we continue to have those discussions and are, are have been encouraged by the expansion of cell, cellular coverage that we've seen. And as the minister stated before, you know, ongoing discussions about making sure that uh, we're maximizing uh, the amount of areas that have cellular co coverage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Lastly, Mr. McNeely. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I just point that out to uh, improve our, our, our safety throughout the uh, roadway systems here. But my last uh, question, I'm just looking at slide number, oops, my thing went blank here. Number 12 here on the variable sign, message signs there. Any chances of getting one of these signs here? Uh, Kevin's shaking his head here, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, any one of these signs here north of Wrigley or just outside of Wrigley notifying the, the, the traffic that you're now entering into the winter road systems, make sure you have your survival gear, that type of notice in that billboard. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Robertson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we do see definitely a need for them uh, on our winter road systems. Um, but the primary uh, use of them, I guess, is to communicate highway conditions. So uh, things like the current weight restriction on our winter roads and ice crossings would be the, I guess, the highest priority just to make sure that people are uh, driving um, that aren't overweight on the winter road and ice crossing systems. And then also to talk about any other restrictions. So sometimes we go to nighttime travel only or you know, no low clearance vehicles, et cetera. So that type of uh, information. But we do um, continue to communicate the public um, you know, from a variety of things of making sure you have good winter tires to making sure you have uh, good survival gear with you. Um, Etc. Um, through our other mechanisms on, you know, radio, Twitter, all of that stuff. So we've been really focusing them to um, emergency type uh, road information. Um, you only have, you know, a few messages that you can get on a variable message board, so you're not actually distracting drivers as they're going through it. So. Um, those longer kind of broader overall general safety messages uh, we generally use other means for and just get the, um, the immediate facts about immediate road conditions on the variable message signs but yes we are hoping to deploy some to the Mackenzie Valley Winter Road. Thank you Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. I'm going to, um, I have Mr. Thompson and Mr. Testart and then we'll be leaving it at that. We have another scheduled public meeting. There could be folks waiting to get in. So I'm going to ask that the questions be very concise and that the answers are as well. Thank you. Mr. Thompson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple of comments. First of all, cell services, I've, that's what I've been hearing. is been one of the big issues about safety and that's on all uh, roads of I know we don't have uh, cell service in, you know, between Yonley from Fort Providence in some spots, Simpson to Providence and vice versa as we go down there. So lots of residents and tourists have been asking that and I um, appreciate the department. It's not your mandate, but you can, you know, you're working with those there. Um, permits, again, are an issue, um, especially when we're dealing with southern companies to, you know, unless this has changed, but sometimes when we're dealing with a southern company, they don't seem to understand the true conditions of our locations. And that's probably one of the biggest issues that I'm hearing from my constituents is that they don't seem to understand. Um, and it, it, to a point where they will go, so well, we'll have to deal with it in court if we have to because they're not working with us. So that is a concern. Um, my first question, though, and it comes back to slide 11, is location of your web cameras and that. Uh, and I'm sitting there looking at uh, one that, you know, at Liard Crossing, and then 12 kilometers later, there's another 
location um, where these web cameras are and then dually co crossing. Um, can you explain why the, the locations are so close and why aren't they a little bit spread out a little further, um, especially in regards to the Wrigley to the dually crossing? Because again, like I said, there's two real close by um, within the community of Fort Simpson. And you know, the conditions at the ferry crossing are gonna be very similar to the conditions at the junction. You okay. know, so thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, just to answer the question, uh, we do need a traffic counter in that location, and I believe that one of the cameras may be linked to that traffic counter. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that we had um, a photo and a visual of the Liard crossing itself, both for uh, winter operations and the ice crossing and then for uh, ferry service, but uh, we can look further into um, those locations uh, specifically and make sure that, uh, of course, we'll make sure that um, they're appropriately spaced uh, when they're implemented. Thank you. Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson. Uh, thank you, and uh, I greatly appreciate that. That makes a lot of sense, um, especially if we can get that 468 just moved up the closer to Wrigley because then that gives you a clearer understanding because they're into the different terrain than what is in to there so um, last question I do have because I think you've answered a number of the questions already here is on slide 8 when you talked about um, sorry the slide about you know the speed the type of clarification the like traffic count how does that improve the safety especially um, you know, clarifications of the vehicles in there. So what does that do with the speed and that? What do you guys use with that data for? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, with that data, uh, we do everything from um, kind of engineering and planning work, but it also feeds into our enforcement. So when we, and speed is a very good example, so thank you for bringing that up. So when we know that uh, there's a certain section where speed is an issue, where trawlers are using excessive speed, then we can work with our enforcement partners and the RCMP to make sure that we're increasing enforcement at that location. The other thing that we can do is the variable message signs now have the capability to actually alert trawlers what their speed is. You may have seen them in southern jurisdictions, but it will say, you know, speed limit is 70 kilometers at an hour. Your speed is 86 kilometers an hour. So we can try, try to target um, those locations where, where there's, I guess, um, data showing um, that speed for, as an example, may be an issue. Uh, the other um, information uh, that we collect, like uh, traffic numbers, and traffic classification feeds into our internal planning and engineering work and so we take a look at the traffic patterns uh, so we can plan uh, future improvements or even get a, gain a better understanding about uh, why a piece a segment of highway is performing in a certain way or requiring additional maintenance etc so thank you mr. chair right thank you nothing further mr. Thompson uh, thank you mr. chair lastly I have mr. Testart. Yeah, so um, this project or these projects amount to $3.555 million. And uh, this fiscal year, the, in the 1819 budget, one, I think it's around 1.3, was approved. So we have some sense of how that money is flowing. Um, how many northern contractors or service providers have been um, successful in these procurement opportunities? I'm just wondering how much of this uh, appropriation is actually going back into the Northwest Territories and if our local contractors have the, the capabilities of delivering these services and technology uh, given that it is relatively new. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Robertson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, some of these technologies are fairly um, specialized and uh, generally there's um, no suppliers of that specific technology here. 
um, there are uh, local companies that could partner and purchase um, and have those opportunities. We are going out for a request for proposals soon, and so I guess we won't have those answers uh, until uh, procurement uh, concludes and we see uh, the type of local content, but with any RFP, of course, we'll uh, include uh, local content um, and northern business opportunities and benefits within the evaluation to try to maximize that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testart? So looking at the breakdown on slide, uh, we'll have to find the slide, but you're familiar with the information, but it's, yeah, there we go. So it's 1.3 three five million 1819 followed by 540 1920 540 2021 and then 560 and 580 in the two subsequent years so what has been spent to date in the 1819 year the one of the 1.355 million thank you thank you ms robertson uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, nothing has been spent to date. Uh, we wanted to come to Standing Committee and share uh, the overall plans with you in advance of going to procurement. Uh, we do expect that procurement, the RFP will be issued shortly, and we expect, um, uh, I guess, procurement and purchase of a lot of the, uh, the units and the systems that will be redeployed in this fiscal year. Uh, which reflects the higher costs in 1819. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Testart? Um, it's, if the minister could commit to providing us some of the um, uh, the northern spend on the, the, at least the first year, the 1.355 million. Thank you. Thank you. Commitment to the minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, when we have the RFP out and concluded, we can certainly share that information with the committee. Okay. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Testart? Nothing further. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I want to thank uh, Minister and your staff for coming and presenting to us today. As you noted, uh, this is a very uh, um, inquisitive and important subject matter to the committee, and we're very happy that you came here and shared this information with us, and uh, please keep us uh, posted as we move forward. We can be adjourned. Thank you. Okay. Okay, committee, um, a very quick...